My name is Ishan, and today I want to start by asking you to imagine a scenario with me. Your six-year-old comes home from school today and tells you he gave blood for a national DNA database that's trying to track genetic-based origins of crime. In the middle of last night, the police took your husband for sending you a text message of the Quran, an ideological virus, they later said. And there are places in your neighborhood you can no longer go to, like your favorite food cart down the street, because the cameras will flag your ethnicity as entering an unauthorized zone. This sounds straight from Orwell's 1984, but it's about today in the Xinjiang province of China, where recent advances in artificial intelligence, video analytics, and the internet of things have helped make the ethnic cleansing of over 1 million Muslim Uyghurs clinical and precise. This is a test case for how already emerging surveillance technologies are reshaping our world. In the last decade, we've seen advanced wiretaps that can hack into your phone from miles away. Software that claims to predict crime before it even happens. And camera systems. They can archive everyone's faces in a major city in real time and in sync with aerial drones and license plate readers that follow you everywhere your car goes, even across state lines. For years now, this surveillance tech has spread rapidly across the world. As companies in China, Israel, Britain, the United States, and more are eagerly serving the insatiable global demand for surveillance technology both from democratic and totalitarian countries alike. With this proliferation, are we so naive to think what happened in Xinjiang won't happen elsewhere, in Myanmar or Venezuela, or wherever tension exists between the powerful and the powerless? By 2030, some 3 billion people, the second half of the world, are expected to gain access to the internet for the first time many of whom already are on the fringes of society. The questions we should be asking then are not, well, the government already knows everything about me. Why should I care? No. The questions we need to ask are what will we see in the next decade? And are we really ready for our biometric identity to be owned by others? More importantly, is democracy ready to withstand the pressures of emerging surveillance technologies? Let me be clear about one thing. This isn't some future challenge. Surveillance tech is already capable of empowering or destroying freedom. The next decade will just show which one becomes the norm. But the norms of how this tech is built and used are being written today and they merit immediate attention before it's too late. Bans on surveillance technologies offer us a moment to pause and reflect, but they are not a long-term answer. We need an approach that can go toe to toe with the immense global demand, serve democracy, and take into account the histories of violence that digital surveillance has delivered to marginalized communities at home and abroad. To find this more responsible approach, I spent the last year interviewing over 40 surveillance thought leaders, from representatives at the ACLU to employees at Palantir Tech, decorated police chiefs, and foreign policy veterans. Here's what I learned in three short lessons. First, surveillance tech is shifting the balance of power between democracy and authoritarianism. Democracy and human rights have never been guaranteed. But today, more than ever, we can't afford to take them for granted. Because what's new today are surveillance technologies that are becoming cheaper, better, and easier to use every single day. And they are changing what authoritarianism is capable of. Research shows that the authoritarian model's greatest vulnerability is internal from revolution. 
but surveillance tech has provided the perfect software patch to locate, monitor, and stifle dissent online or offline before it even begins. With this patch, authoritarianism is now in digital form, more stable and competitive than ever before. When people are always worried about a system monitoring and linking their actions to their profile, their behavior will change. They will speak and act less freely. Will we? If we don't pay attention, our democracy too will become less free. In fact, according to Freedom House, a US government funded research nonprofit, the United States has now experienced four consecutive years of decline in internet freedom. Our institutions have been too slow to protect us. Have you heard of Clearview AI, the facial recognition company that scraped your photos, along with 3 billion others from virtually the entire internet, Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, to train their algorithms without consent? It's a radical erosion of privacy, to say the least but they still secured contracts with nearly 2,000 public agencies across 49 states. And while just now we're seeing some legal efforts like those in Illinois aimed at holding Clearview AI accountable, there is a globalized surveillance industry ready to make millions taking advantage of the cracks in our democratic system. And there are many. In truth, our system, how police acquire and deploy surveillance tech, has been widely described as a wild west without accountability or transparency. Last summer, Robert Williams became the first known person to be wrongfully accused by an algorithm. And he only found out by a chance slip of the tongue from the interrogating officer. But from 2011 to 2019, US law enforcement use nearly 400,000 facial recognition searches. How many more mistakes have there been? How many more will there be? We have no way of knowing. The legal system is meant to be slow and measured, but it is particularly egregious for surveillance tech with an estimated pace of 10 years behind. Most of the warrants filed for invasive technologies are granted without any real scrutiny. And the contracts between tech companies and law enforcement almost always come with non-disclosure agreements that hide the tech from police reports or court filings. Meanwhile, billions of dollars in federal police grants go to these black box partnerships, which make it really easy for surveillance capitalists to sensationalize their technology Overpromise and underdeliver, as there's no standard to evaluate if the tech is actually successful at meeting the community's needs or just contributing to inequality with wrongful arrests and convictions. You see, surveillance undermines the privacy of everyone, just not equally. The more these tools spread throughout our neighborhoods and streets without oversight or transparency, the more they empower an unjust criminal justice system and the weaker our democracy becomes. Which brings me to the second lesson I learned. In this competitive digital era, democratic leadership must proceed by example. So where do we start? Well, as citizens, one of the most immediate places to find hope are in the 14 US cities that have passed surveillance ordinances, state and local legislation that engages communities on surveillance tech. In Oakland, California, for example, the Oakland Privacy Advisory Commission, OPAC, was created to answer questions like how the tech will be used, where will the data be stored, and what is the potential for disparate impact? All of this before the technology is purchased and after to assess annually how well these technologies are meeting the community's needs. The commission's chairman, Brian Hoffer, revealed to me how in a city entering its 18th year of federal oversight from the toxic relations between the police and the community, OPAC was a force of trust, a bridge between a department who might be loath to embrace any oversight and people who would never believe a word the police might say. 
surveillance ordinances might be the first step to introducing oversight into the broader policing system. As one police chief explained to me, surveillance comes at the cost of the taxpayer. So it's in our best interests to work with the community rather than against. To this end, the billions of dollars that fund police acquisitions of surveillance tech could be conditioned on the passage of surveillance ordinances, which could go from 14 cities to 50 states. Part of these billions should also go towards standing up these nationwide surveillance oversight efforts like OPAC and paying the staff like Brian and his team, who, to this, who still to this day remain volunteers. Community-based transparency is how we lead the world on surveillance tech. But it's not all we need to do. A big part of the picture is how our allies and the web of US companies and intelligence, counter-narcotics, and immigration enforcement agencies that supply this technology and know-how to the very same regimes we criticize for human rights abuses in Latin America, Asia, and across Africa. But there's a different picture we could paint, one in which these relationships are used to raise the legal and governance standards for the use of surveillance tech and deliver greater community-based transparency and oversight as an international norm. But to do this, we need a better idea of where our tech is going and to what ends. As a country, it's in our strategic and moral best interest to have this knowledge. But right now, companies are under no pressure, obligation to collect or share information on how their tech might be misused. In fact, one industry expert I spoke with mentioned how often the manufacturer never even knows the end user. This can't be the norm going forward. In truth, we'll need some sort of international monitoring effort to connect worldwide abuses of this technology to their source, something that elevates what's expected of companies engaging in these exports and sets a baseline for acceptable and unacceptable cases of use. But this will take time and coordination. One way the United States can lead by example now is to require our exported tech to have internal software visibility that alerts us if the tech is being misused. These real-time controls look like identity verification systems, information flow controls, and artificially intelligent techniques designed to continuously learn about cases of misuse. This isn't wishful thinking. It was a solution Microsoft proposed to the US government just last year as a more tech savvy approach to export controls. Ideally, this becomes a global standard for the export community to know about misuse and safeguard against it. But in expanding our oversight of exports, it's crucial we don't become abusers ourselves especially when it comes to countries' data sovereignty. Many of the experts I spoke with revealed how importing countries often easily hand away their citizens' rights through the contracts they strike with surveillance tech companies. For example, Zimbabwe accepted a surveillance system free of charge. All the company received was unfettered access to the entire country's biometric data to gain market advantage, by training their algorithms to better recognize darker facial complexions. The globalized surveillance industry has every incentive to continue this exploitative data siphoning because it means locked in dependent customers and never ending returns. Leading by example here means resisting the impulse to siphon data and setting the tone for others to do the same. But if there's anything you take away from this talk, I hope it's this. The third lesson I learned is that surveillance reform is an issue both of racial and socioeconomic justice at home and the future of democracy and human rights abroad. But these are two sides of the same coin. The struggles of Xinjiang are shared here to varying degrees in Detroit, Los Angeles, and more. They are not the same but they are connected and we need to start treating them as such so that child DNA databases and apps that hunt for ideological viruses remain an exception, not the norm of 2030 or beyond. 
democracy and human rights have, are not inevitable. They've never been. And recently, we've lost our way. But it's not yet too late to reclaim leadership from the corporations or authoritarian states who currently dominate surveillance time. Doing so may very well be the first step towards restoring democracy's moral place and setting the digital norms of the 21st century. We all have a part to play. As the late John Lewis once said, democracy is not a state, but an act. Let's.